Kevin Ferrara, thank you for joining me from Pennsylvania today. I'm glad to have you here to talk about PFAS and the Air Force and um, AFFF, a firefighting foam that has these toxic chemicals in it. Can we start with, you were an Air Force firefighter. Can you give us the little like overview of your career? Sure. Uh you know, first and foremost, you know, thanks for having me on the show. Um, you know, I welcome the opportunity to, to get my story out there. So my my Air Force career started in 1991. Um, I left central Pennsylvania, uh, joined the Air Force, um, started my first uh, training was at Chanute Air Force Base in Rantoul, Illinois. That's where if you were going to be a firefighter in the Air Force, um, that's where you went for training at the time. Com uh, completed my training there and then uh, my first assignment was at Cannon Air Force Base in Clovis, New Mexico. Uh, I was there for four years. Um, after that, um, in 95, I, I left. I got out of the Air Force, returned to Pennsylvania for a few years. But my passion was firefighting, and I, I wanted to come back in as a firefighter. So in 2001, I rejoined the Air Force, uh, went to Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona, found my way to Germany for four years. And then uh, as my career started wrapping up, I finished at Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia. Okay, and what is the sort of the daily routine of an Air Force firefighter? You're doing um, training and testing and, and what what's that like? So an Air, an Air Force firefighter, <clears throat> excuse me, it's pretty much the same as a municipal firefighter. Uh, with the exception, you know, obviously in the Air Force, we have aircraft, um, so it, it's like an airport. Um, that's really the only thing that's different from a municipal fire department that you may find um, within your local community. Uh, most fire departments in the Air Force worked a, a 24 on, 24 off shift. So you worked every other day, every two weeks, you got what we called a Kelly day. So it was an extra day off. Um, but yeah, you know, firefighting is, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, you know, we always kid it's put the wet stuff on the red stuff <laughs> and, uh, you know, with a few specialized things, you know, in the military. Now, obvious, you know, like I said, with the aircraft, um, you know, for deployments, uh, for, you know, when we deploy, you know, to, to foreign countries and everything, that's, that's really about the only thing that's different than what you may see uh, within your local communities. So in the late 1970s, the U.S. military started using this AFFF that has PFAS, these toxic substances in it. And around 2006, the military started phasing that out at European military bases. And then in 2016, started phasing it out at U.S. bases. But back in the 1990s, what did you know about this AFFF that you were using on a daily basis? Well, to be honest, we didn't know anything about um, what PFAS, you know, what PFAS was and what a triple F really was. Um, you know, when I first started in 1991 at Chinook, that was the first time that I was in contact with firefighting foam. Um, you know, I had heard about it, never actually seen or put hands on it. And as we were using it, the characteristics of it looked just like your dish soap when you wash dishes it suds up it, it's the same color um you know all of that and we were told it was soap and water you know our instructors had told us a triple f firefighting foam is just soap and water it's perfectly safe you don't have to worry about it um you know of course now through research and everything uh we found those documents that says you know dating back to the 70s not so much it's not it's not safe yeah, there are these studies that go back to like the late 1960s that, that show the toxicity of PFAS in, in lab animals and workers and some of the like 3M and DuPont factories. But you weren't given any sort of warning or notice or information? Not, not a bit. Um, you know, throughout my entire career, my 20 year career, um, you know, there was there was no mention that a triple F firefighting foam was hazardous or, or toxic. Um, you know, almost every every installation I was assigned to, starting at Chanute, Cannon Air Force Base, you know, other bases, we were told the same thing. It, it was repeated. A triple F was soap and water. It was perfectly safe, and and you know, we we took that as being the truth because you know our leadership we expected those individuals to know what they were talking about, 
and we had no reason to doubt them. Um, and it was only, uh, you know, years after I retired, um, you know, I started uncovering the truth and it's like, not so much, you know, we found the fish kill studies, we found the lab animal studies. Um, and you know, it was just like our leadership knew about this and they, they withheld it. Um, to me, they intentionally withheld that from those that use the products. And now we see where we are today. We have individuals that are sick and, and uh, you know, unfortunately dying because of that exposure to the, the products that they knew was hazardous to us. So being a firefighter carries a certain amount of risk. Being in the military carries a certain amount of risk. But what are your concerns and the concerns you're hearing from other veterans about their exposure to PFAS? The, the biggest concern right now is, and you know, all the firefighters that I talk to, they ask me because of the exposure that they've had to PFAS um, and to you know firefighting foam, are they going to get cancer? Um, that's their biggest fear because there's no magic pill to get rid of PFAS. Um, once you're exposed to it, once it's in your body, it stays in your body for years. Um, so their their biggest concern is, are they going to get sick because of this? And unfortunately. The DOD, the military, is not telling them anything, um, you know, the, the hazards or risks associated with it. They're doing their own independent research. They're, they're, they're contacting me, other firefighters, and we've always said firefighting is like a brotherhood. It's a huge network, and we, we bounce things off of each other, ideas, and we constantly network and communicate. And that's how we're learning more and more about PFAS. It's not from the VA the, the Department of Defense, you know, the Air Force, these military installations. It's independent research that we're, we're doing on our own and sharing those, those, those findings. So what has, um, as people have expressed concerns, say to the Air Force or the, the military, what has the Air Force's or the military's response been to veterans concerned about PFAS? Um, to be honest, not much. Uh, you know, we've the, the DOD and the Air Force, they're starting last year, last October, they're, they're starting to do PFAS blood testing. Um, so they, they know there's some hazards associated with PFAS. So they're, they're testing that. But as for, you know, relaying anything, you know, health wise, um, things that they should be concerned with, um, offering pamphlets, brochures, everybody that I've talked to, they're saying that's not happening. Um, even the VA, the VA is not providing really any information on PFAS uh, exposure. And that concerns veterans and firefighters. Um, you know, they, they're, they're thirsty. They're, they want this information. They want to be educated on it, uh, but they're hitting roadblocks, you know, one after the other, and they're, they're simply not getting that information. So can we talk about the VA a little bit? Um, if if, for instance, you have concerns, health problems or concerns, can you describe the process for a veteran going to the VA and maybe seeking information, seeking blood tests? Sure. So, uh, you know, most individuals I've talked to, you know, veteran firefighters, they approach their, their doctors at the, at the Veterans Affairs um, and they express, you know, their concerns. A lot of times they're getting pushback from these doctors uh, because if you actually go on the VA's website uh, for PFAS, it says they don't recommend a PFAS blood test because they consider almost everybody, every American has detectable levels of PFAS in their blood. So they don't recommend that. So, you know, firefighters will walk into their the VA clinics, uh, speak to their doctor and ask, you know, often demand these PFAS blood tests. And they're told, no, the VA does not offer those. Um, you know, and in regards to PFAS itself, it's pretty much the same thing. They're, they're not getting really any information from these VA doctors, uh, you know, because for, for whatever reason it may be that, you know, these doctors aren't aware of what PFAS is, um, you know, installation physicians, uh, you know, a lot of the firefighters I've talked to, they said their own doctors had never heard of PFAS up until last year when when some emails and and things were being socialized through the medical community they had no idea what it is and and they're doing some research on their own because their leadership is not providing very much information on it as well 
And so have you, or people you know, have you, have you had your blood tested? Do you have PFAS? Are you having health problems that you think are related to this exposure? So for me, um, you know, I've had a PFOA, P-F-O-A blood test. Um, now my, in, my insurance provider, which is TRICARE or Humana Military uh, is what it is now, that's the only thing that they tested for. And it took me literally a year to track down the the testing codes for that blood test. And my, you know, my civilian doctor here in Central PA, once I described you know why I wanted the test and what PFAS was, he was absolutely all for it. He said, we have to get you tested. We have to make sure you're okay. We had the blood test done. It went to a lab here in Pennsylvania. It came back. Unfortunately, it said non-detectable. And I'm not surprised at that because this particular lab that tested it, they have on their detectable limit, each, each lab that you get your blood tested through, their equipment is calibrated differently. There's no real standard. So this particular lab, they had a higher detectable level than what others do. So that's a lot of firefighters I've talked to went through the same lab and they found the same thing. Uh, with PFOA, it comes back as non-detectable. And some of these firefighters have, had, have said to me, they were slathered in foam. There's no way it should come back as non-detectable. Um, the other side of that is, you know, it's it's costly for, because the VA and the DOD is not testing veterans, uh, former firefighters like myself, we have to pay out of pocket. Uh, if we want the same test that the DOD is doing today, we have to pay out of pocket for that. And it's, it's not right, so, you know. So, and just kind of to, to remind people, there are thousands of toxic substances in sort of the PFOS family, and PFOA and PFOS are the two that the military has been testing for in local groundwater, such as in, in Clovis and near Holloman Air Force Base. Um, but there are, thousands of these chemicals and these replacement foams oftentimes might have other types of PFAS other than PFOA and PFAS. Have you, have you been paying attention to kind of the replacement process and how those other sorts of chemicals might be affecting people's health or local groundwater, things like that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm following, I'm following this process daily. Um, you know, we can break it down to hourly. You know, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, finding new things on the internet um, because, again, it goes back to that. I have to research this information. I have to dig for it because it's not being readily provided to the public, to firefighters, to military personnel. Um, so what I found so far is that, you know, the, the DOD is looking at a non-fluorinated foam and the the 2020 and i believe the 2021 national defense authorization acts both state that by fiscal year 24 they had the military has to switch to a non-fluorinated foam so there's this sudden scramble to find uh, what the air force calls eco-friendly or a safer foam so right now they have it down to i believe six that they're looking at um, the pushback is the mil spec it has to meet a certain specification that the military has established uh, for fight, you know, firefighting um, with uh, aircraft fuels and, uh, and other fuels. Um, so that's how they, they narrowed it down to down to the six right now. Will they meet that, that suspense date? I hope so. Um, I'm not putting a lot of faith in it, to be honest, uh, simply because they've kicked this can down the road so long uh, in terms of you know, finding uh, an alternative, um, you know, so I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I know you hear from lots of veterans in particular, um, but I don't feel like it's a conversation that's really happening um, publicly in a lot of arenas. And I'm curious why you think there might be some reluctance among veterans or active duty military members to talk about their concerns, to talk about their exposure, to talk about this issue? Well, first, first and foremost, with active duty military and DOD civilians, they have a fear of reprisal. 
if they speak up about this, they're in fear that they're going to be punished in some fashion uh, for voicing their concerns. Um, now, as for former firefighters, uh, veterans like myself, you know, yes, we're still military in a sense, uh, we're retirees, uh, but we have a little bit more leeway as to, you know, voicing our concerns and everything and, and, and showing our frustrations. Um, not so much with, uh, like I said, with the, the active duty folks, because um, I've even before I retired, I, I witnessed it to where firefighters would express some concerns about certain things. And almost instantly, their leadership would frown upon that um, and you know, punish them in, in some fashion uh, for really voicing valid concerns. And, and, and PFAS is definitely a valid concern. It, it, it affects one's health and they, they should be talking about it and they, should have, they shouldn't have to be afraid to do so. They should be able to do so freely um, and have a, an open and, you know, an open dialogue with their, their leadership and, and come up with some solutions, but that's, that's not happening. I'm wondering if, um, in addition to that, like I grew up with police officers and firefighters and, um, there is a certain, uh, culture and pride and, um, you know, maybe even expectation that you don't talk about your anxieties, you don't talk about your concerns. Do you think that that plays into this at all, or no? Um, yeah, a little, a little bit. Um, you know, we've always said, you know, don't any any organization don't air your dirty laundry. Um, this is this is a lot of dirty laundry with with PFAS. Uh, you know, we've uncovered the what I consider to be a cover up. Um, you know, dating back decades ago, um, and I think it was only because of public peer pressure. Word some word got out somehow to the public, and it picked up some momentum. And really, I think that's how we we have learned the significance of PFAS contamination. You know, in our military installations. And communities. So whoever started that, you know, I thank them for doing that. Uh, and you know, we're we're picking up the the pace now. Um, but yeah, you know, it's there. There is, you know, it's like I said with with the military. Um, it's almost an unwritten code that you don't talk about certain things, um, even though it affects your health. Um, and that that should not, like I said before, that that should not happen. We should be able to freely talk about. Um, concerns, you know, health concerns that you have. So researching PFAS and working on this story over the past couple of years, I've often been reminded of, of um, how veterans have had to deal with the impacts of Agent Orange, exposure to Agent Orange, and I'm curious if you see any parallels between what has happened with Agent Orange and what's happening with PFAS. Ironically, we consider PFAS contamination, uh, AFFF contamination, the the 21st century Agent Orange. Um, you know, we had we had the Agent Orange dealings with you know the the Vietnam era. Now we're dealing with PFAS. Uh, a lot of firefighters, a lot of veterans have have tied those two together. Um, and you look at how long it's taken the military to really recognize the impact that Agent Orange had on those Vietnam veterans. And I, I really hope we don't have the same thing with PFAS because um, every day that ticks by, more and more veterans, their dependents, innocent civilians living you know, near these, these contaminated military installations are becoming sick. And we have to, we, we know the contamination is there, it's, it's proven, but we have to get the military, the DOD uh, to step up and start taking action um, to really shut off what I call the source. You can't you can't clean up something until you turn off the source of contamination. And so, what would you like to see at this point? How would you like to see the Air Force and the VA moving forward? What are some concrete steps you think they could take? Um, the 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 first one is start conducting their own research. Um, a recent congressional hearing, they were asked, both the DOD and the VA, asked if they were doing their own research, and both entities replied that they were not. They were relying on in, you know, third-party research. They have the capability of doing their own research. They have the, 
the, the, the personnel to survey, um, if they would just do that, they're receiving millions and millions and millions of dollars from Congress, but they're not putting it to good use. Um, they, they keep saying they're doing research and testing. Well, we, we haven't seen this research and testing. Where, where's the money going? Um, secondly, take that money, take the funding that Congress is allocating to, to the military each and every year and start doing remediation efforts. Um, you know, again, it goes back to you have to, before you can move forward, you have to start at the source of this contamination. Uh, they know where it's at, but they're not applying any of this funding or efforts to actually remediate um, the, the source of this contamination. Um, so really, it, it's almost they're, they're being reactive instead of proactive. I, I wish the military would be more proactive. Had they been proactive years ago, we may not have been in the situation we are today, but unfortunately we are. But there's, you know, there's opportunity for them to be proactive, be leaders, uh, be good stewards of the community, and, and do what's right. So here at NMPBS, we've done a lot of coverage of the groundwater contamination um, from Cannon Air Force Base and Holloman Air Force Base. I'm wondering if you can kind of take us back in time a little bit to when that PFAS was on the surface and kind of describe the sorts of daily activities of, of how it would have gotten into the soil, into the groundwater. Sure. So, you know, like I, I like I said, I, I started at Cannon Air Force Base in 1991, uh, and I was there from 1991 to 1995. So for, for me and the, the personnel that were there with me, every shift, and again, we worked 24 hours on, 24 hours off, we would do what we called daily operational checks. And that essentially consisted of those that were assigned to a crash truck, uh, an airport firefighting vehicle. We would drive out along the flight line and at some point we would stop, activate the firefighting system, uh, which involved the, the firefighting foam. We would discharge that foam onto the soil. We, we couldn't put it on the taxiway because it was a little slippery and we didn't want the, the aircraft to drive over it. So we would discharge it into the soil. It would set there for a few hours. Uh, and if you were to go back a few hours or so later, it would all be soaked into the ground. You, you wouldn't be able to see it anymore. And we, we did this every day for the, the four years that I was there. Uh, I can't imagine how much contamination occurred before I got to Cannon or firefighters got to Holloman. And that same process of doing daily operational checks occurred at every Air Force installation. It was almost a standard, that's what you did to make sure the trucks operated right. So whatever happened at Cannon Air Force Base, I can say with almost 100% certainty, the same thing happened at Holloman Air Force Base uh, and other locations, um, Kirtland Air Force Base in, in Albuquerque, the, the same thing would have occurred there. Um, so, you know, it's, and, and again, that, that firefighting foam, it, it sat on the surface. Eventually it, it, it permeated into the soil and just like with with rainwater it you know water will find um you know the the least resistance and those materials end up finding their way into the underground aquifer systems um, to where we know today a lot of wells were drilled that's where a lot of residents in, in new mexico uh, through these aquifers receive their drinking water um, or water for their their, their livestock mm -hmm. and it, it's crazy to think today that during those four years that I unknowingly was contaminating the soil and the aquifer in New Mexico, I was at the same time drinking the contaminated water um, through the received through these these wells, these drinking wells at Cannon Air Force Base. And yet nobody told us that, you know, things were things were, you know, contaminated or we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, we were just that's what we were told to do. Um, Again, you know, we went back to our leadership. They were in those positions. We assumed they knew what they were talking about, and um, we never questioned it. One of the things that I've noticed here, and, and maybe it's universal at, at bases, but we kind of have this rotating commanders um, who are here for a few years and then move on. And I'm curious if, if, 
if you think or, or what you think about how that how those changes in leadership affect the Air Force's ability to feel responsible to the community. It, it absolutely changes how things get done. Um, when you have a rotation of leadership, the new leadership is going to come in and prioritize things that they want to work on uh, and see accomplished during their rotation. Uh, most of these commanders are on they're in charge for about two or three years. Um, that's about the average. Sometimes you get four or more, depending on where they're at. But the, as I said, these, these leaders will come in, they have a priority list, and that's the things they work on because that's the things they wanna see accomplished um, and you know before they move on. Unfortunately, that impacts PFAS remediation. Um, I would, I would think at this point for the, the Air Force, the military, PFAS remediation is your number one priority. Um, but I really feel it's not at some of these installations. And that's why we're seeing that can being kicked down the road. It's, we're not seeing much progress in terms of remediation uh, or efforts, um, you know, or emphasis, efforts and emphasis put on PFAS, um, you know, the, the, the swap out the cleanup, uh, medical care, anything like that. So when you and I talked earlier, you mentioned that you feel a sense of guilt sometimes, and I'm not suggesting that you're responsible for the contamination, but can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, when I when I started at, at Chinook Air Force Base, we were told, you know, AFFF was just open water. Um, my first assignment at Cannon Air Force Base, the same thing was echoed. It's soap and water, it's perfectly safe. Uh, you know, we washed our uniforms, we washed the trucks, we washed our stalls. There was incidents where we sprayed foam out uh, for fire prevention visits and, and young kids played in it because they thought it was cool. It, it looked like snow. Um, looking back at that, you know, again, the four years that I was there, we did this, you know, we, we sprayed foam every day, thousands and thousands of gallons of, of firefighting foam. Um, just while I was there, you know, got into the soil and eventually into the drinking water. And I look back at it now and I hear the stories about, you know, local dairy farmers with their, you know, they're, they're contaminated, the, the, the milk, um, their families are contaminated. Um, you know, Clovis residents had to have bottled water. Um, and I, you know, I, I say to myself, I'm like, my gosh, you know, for four years, I unknowingly contributed to to all of that, and it, you know, I, I do, I, I feel guilty, uh, and I'm certain other firefighters that were there with me would would share in this. We, had we known then what we know today, there is no way we would deliberately spray a triple F, firefighting foam you know, into the, into the environment, into the soil and, and allow it to contaminate it. Uh, you know, it's just, it, that's, it, it bothers me that, that so many residents in, in, in New Mexico, because while I was at Clovis, you know, Holloman was operational, Kirtland's operational, um, and we did the same thing. And, um, you know, just to think that there's thousands and thousands, really probably millions of, of innocent residents that are now contaminated. They're, they're exposed to PFAS through drinking water um, or, or other, other contact. Uh, just knowing that what we did affected all of those individuals, I mean, it, it does. It, it weighs heavily on my mind, and it, it, there there is a, a strong sense of guilt. There's, if 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 I could go back in time and, and tell myself, "Don't do what you're about to do," I would gladly do it. Right. So you were stationed at Cannon, but you're familiar with this issue all across the United States. I'm curious what you wish people around Cannon and Holloman understood about what's happening nationwide? So, you know, it's the, the whole, the whole PFAS contamination. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, 
it's a national issue. It's a global issue. Um, I, I, I encourage the residents in New Mexico to pressure their local, state, federal representatives to socialize information, uh, you know, pass out information about PFAS contamination. Um, that's the first start is you know educating folks on what PFAS is, how it got into the soil, um, and what preventative measures uh, they need to take today um, to you know to to minimize their exposure. Um, and at you know at the at the same time, meet you know try to try to meet with these military officials and establish some type of, of dialogue, some type of relationship between the community and the military. Because um, I've always said, if the military would just come out and apologize and say, we're sorry for what, what happened, but we're going to work on this, we're going to move forward, that would be a great start. But they're not doing it. It seems like that that fence line that that divides the military base and the community you know, even though it's probably like an eight foot high fence, it might as well be a thousand foot high fence because it almost seems like that's the barrier that whatever happens on base, that's the military's uh, issue. And they don't believe anything outside that fence is, is their concern. And that's not that's not what our military should be. You know, military is taxpayer funded and it should be an open uh, and cordial dialogue, a, a great working relationship, but we're, we're simply not seeing that. And, it, and it, it's happening all over the United States and around the world um, at military installations, um, even foreign countries. They're, some of their military installations as well, they're, they're dealing with the same thing. There's no, there's a disconnect somewhere and they're, they're, they can't establish that, that communication. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for communicating with us, for talking with me today. I really appreciate it. Again, Laura, I, I appreciate being on and um, I, you know, anything that you need, I'm, I'm here to help out. Thank you.